Well, kia ora again. Um, I want to look at a different topic completely from the others. And this, <laughs> this is a presentation about some writing that I've done that's been going on for about six years. <laughs> I still have no idea what the point is. And there's not a lot of point to this presentation except that I explore some characters in a great level of detail. And I will undo a couple of myths in the process. So I call this the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker because it sounded like a good idea. And then the varying fortunes of Goldfield's merchants, which actually is not the brightest of titles. And I'll just pick up my clicker here. Um, so, so yeah, we'll, we'll get us get on with it. So basically, one of the things that um, happened with the gold rush, you've got to understand. The Californian rush kicks off in 1848 and really gets going in 1849. Uh, the Australian gold rush kicks off in 1851, really gets going 51, 52. Um, and Otago comes through 10 years later. Now, 10 years doesn't sound like that long, except in the gold rush, it's forever. I mean, after two, three, one year, a lot of the easy gold is got. And so you've basically got these miners who go out <clears throat> and they work hard. And like this is a picture from, um, um, I can't remember his name actually, from Australia. And he's picturing these guys with their, if you watched my water um, video you'll see that they're using cradles here um, and they go out and they find good gold but then eventually it gets to the point where you can't be an individual miner anymore and what you've got to do is you've got to team up or worse start working for wages so um, then they had created this whole self-identification myth um, Lawson couches this phrase in his um, his poem about the shepherds. They call no biped lord or sir and touch their hat to no man. The idea was they were their own bosses and uh, they didn't have to check in, they didn't have to report, they didn't have to sign up. Well, that all changed. So everyone was either a shareholder in a sluicing syndicate or a quartz miner. This is a picture of a quartz mine at... Um, Bendigo, um, and uh, from Western Australia, I think, and um, they, so they had got, they had gotten away from what they liked most in terms of Goldfield's culture. So they're working <clears throat> as wage men, and not particularly well paid wage men in Australia, and all of a sudden there's a rush breaks out three days sailing across the Tasman. In fact, when um, the steam launches were, the steam boats were going, it was, you could do it um, pretty easily in three days. And um, Gabriel's Gully, when that launches in um, 1861, a lot of Australians come over. Now, Terry Hearn in um, the book, Rushing for Gold, which you'll hear me referring to quite a lot, partly because it's got my name on the front. But Terry Hearn found that a lot of these Australian miners came over expecting to do really well and didn't. And so um, it wasn't necessarily what everyone expected. The big advantage of Gable's Gully was the idea that its topography, its gold deposition, everything else was nearly identical to, to um, Victoria. So when they were developing the mining laws, when they were developing how you're going to actually work things, they were pretty well able to just do a cut and paste. So our mining laws, um, which were constructed then, 1858 uh, mining laws, were pretty well cut and paste Australian ones. And uh, when they got to Gabriel's Gully, there was very little needed to be altered. And um, so basically it was... This that saw the first trans-Tasman merchants follow. And here, the merchants are actually the larger tents. There's a couple here, and there's one down here, and there's two up here that I know of. 
um, probably a lot more unofficial ones, slide rod tents and things like that. But they follow for the same reason. When the rush for gold first breaks out, there is huge money to be made if you can get to um, a new rush as the only storekeeper or as one of the few and you get to sell your shovels instead of selling them for uh, five shillings you sell them for three pounds and that sort of thing which is quite a lot more obviously <coughs> um, and so when the central otago rush breaks out it breaks out in august 62 this repeats the same sort of thing so these these merchants i quite like this this is um kevin rogers um artwork and if i ever get around to actually publishing my um my thesis while well, turning it into a readable book instead of what it is at the moment um he does a beautiful job of capturing this um of a rush for bread so these guys have obviously arrived they've set up they're mining away but of course they didn't bring enough provisions and you turn up with your bread cart and you can sell your your bread for a pound a loaf if you want um so they want to recreate this idea of when they first opened up um, for business on a rush locale, they make a lot of profit. Now, one of the problems with that is people think you continue to do that, which is just daft. I mean, no one continues to make vast profits. No one does. I mean, you, that's economics 101. It's about fifth form economics, actually. Because the whole idea is, is, if you're making monopolistic profits, what happens, you get other operators come in and set up their tents, and pretty soon you're not charging a pound a loaf, you're charging 10 pence a loaf or whatever they were selling for. Um, but, you get that? So, it was well, that myth of the only people to make money in the gold rush was the um, storekeepers. Well, you can read about that in my chapter in the book. But um, some of these were um, large Australian concerns. You had ones like Langer and Thoneman, Sargood and Sons, Whittington Brothers, Dalgetty's. And they tend to open branches in Dunedin and then, so they open in Dunedin and then expand into the province um, with places like Lawrence, Clyde, Queenstown. Uh, there were others who were failed merchants. So, in another presentation, I talk about the Cardrona Hotel, uh, George Butler Bond, who builds the Empire Hotel, which is later renamed the uh, Cardrona. And this guy here, this guy's fascinating. Henry Workman Robinson. Now, he bounces all over the Victorian gold rushes, and he keeps setting up stores, and he keeps going bust. He went bust, I think, from his journal two, three, or maybe even four times. But he comes over and he doesn't, he, he comes here and he actually doesn't work as a merchant. I think he finally worked out, he wasn't very good at it. But he's one of the most respected Goldfields wardens because he actually knows all the laws because he's <clears throat> tangled with a lot of them. And um, he gets a huge, huge level of respect because he actually knows his law, and um, he, uh, he's been a miner, and um, he knows how to interpret the law. It's quite interesting um, how um, he goes on, his wife was quite an accomplished um, writer, um, back when women didn't do such things, and um, he, oh, one of his specialities, he settles in, um, settles water disputes very well. Also, one of the people that came over was Jean Desiré Ferro, who sets up the first productive vineyard in central Otago. He was he failed in near Bendigo, set up the Bendigo, like Australian Bendigo uh, wine growing area, comes over here um, and pretty well does the same thing. And um, uh, yeah, takes over the first vineyard. Um, if we look at, um, when we look at merchants of the gold rush, there's this idea that, that it's a dichotomized, that's, you know, two groups, of you've got the poor, dumb, drunken, stupid miners who take all their gold and they spend it on booze. That can't have happened. It just, no. But anyway, this myth. 
and the venal merchants who come along and take all their money. And that's just not the case. I mean, you read through actual, there's several journals available of um, miners who actually, some who did well, some who didn't. And yes, occasionally they'd go on a spree, but this is a photo in 1861. Um, that would have cost a small fortune. They are just taking a photo because they can. They've set it up. They're actually deliberately acting stupid just for the benefit of the photographer. The, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> and um, so we, we, we're fighting an uphill battle trying to get people to understand that it was a competitive environment. If you got there, started selling stuff first, you made money. If you came second, then you didn't make as much. Um, so the relationship, the, one of the things that the point is here, so you look at this, this is St. Bathins, um, and uh, so you had miners who became merchants, but then you had merchants who became miners, because generally speaking you couldn't operate a store without a miner's right, um, which is one of, the, one of the ways they made sure you generated revenue or well, they re generated revenue. Miners and merchants, if you have a look at my presentation on water-powered gold rushes, then you'll see that merchants and miners combined to develop claims. Miners borrowed money off merchants to develop their claims, and merchants built businesses. And they tended, the merchants tended to be the mayors, the councillors, the, uh, the, you know, set up the actual society around what the miners were doing. Okay, so um, I want to look at some representative merchants to um, examine, the, sort of let's examine the myth. You've got the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And the butcher we're going to talk about is uh, Benjamin Naylor, the uh, baker is uh, a wonderful chap who, <laughs> who we'll talk about in a minute and uh, by, the <laughs> by the name of uh, Gear and uh, this is Charles Zyler who's the candlestick maker. We'll come back to that. So let's look at Benjamin Naylor. Um, if you've heard of the firm Naylor Love, uh, the Naylor part of that is on, has on the board. It was started by Benjamin Naylor's son um, and there is a Naylor still involved in the board, I believe it's his uh, great-grandson. But um, So the Naylor family have done very well. So he starts in, he trains as a blacksmith to start with, and he emigrates between, um, from Scotland, where he uh, grows up, uh, sorry, Nottinghamshire, not Scotland, and he goes to Victoria, he's 21 years old, and uh, 10 years later, comes across Gabriel's Gully, he goes into business with a store in Waitahuna, um, with another um, minor turned store owner from Victoria, who was James Clark Brown. Now, Brown leaves the partnership to open store, new stores in Lawrence and Queenstown. So Waitahuna is a rush town, it's sort of a temporary town. Lawrence is the more permanent, and Queenstown develops even more. And Naylor then, so he's left by himself, he joins the rush to central Otago, which breaks out in August 62. Well, news of the gold does. So he gets there um, around about December. He, so it, when he arrives, he arrives in Hartley Town, then it becomes Dunstan, then it becomes Clyde. Um, I think it was Coal Point, actually, before then. And um, <clears throat> he opens his own store, leaves the store in Waiatahuna, uh, quite quickly works out that that's a dumb move, closes it, shifts everything up, and he starts up. So here's the first photo of the town, and it's actually all tents. These places here don't last, uh, partly because the Clyde uh, floods often, and uh, <laughs> you just don't live down there. Um, these are canvas, so if you look at the cottages presentation, these are canvas stores. These are canvas um, businesses, same here. So what you've got 
by law you have to have a wooden facade and you can actually spot the hotels this is not a good photograph but you can spot the hotel in that they have a light at the front but what's at the back of most of these certainly in 1862 this is from 63 is that's te that's a tent that's not even corrugated iron they, they put corrugated iron in eventually and this is much later I think this is uh, about 69 no 67 um, so Naylor um, is down here he's one of these stores and as the town sort of becomes more and more permanent he builds a stone store um, the Victoria store and so he can he's basically following him now quite quickly he gets involved in um, politics he becomes the first he's voted on to the first Clyde Borough Council he becomes mayor um, and he buys Chester Main or the Mataka Nui farm which he names Chester Main in 1874 and he adds dairy cows and this is this is where he buys um, he has dairy cows and pigs um, and he expands to include a butchery basically because his brother comes out um, his brother had been serving in the army and um, and so he his brother came out and joined him and so because his brother was a skilled butcher he basically expands into butchery which makes a lot of sense he's got livestock on his farm anyway um, it's not unusual for miners and merchants to purchase farms this was always land ownership was the goal of many in Australasia because it was the chance to become part of this British ideal of becoming sort of the landowning gentry <clears throat> um, um, I've found that one of the challenges when people when these guys die is they you, you look at their job and it's listed as farmer but then you look back and discover that they've actually only been a farmer a short time most of the time they were a merchant of some form or even before then they were a miner so it's quite hard to actually follow miner merchant farmer um, but he starts developing um, this uh, here's his business again so that's the Victoria store um, and his house which you might have seen in uh, Clyde is right beside quite an impressive house and um, he's got a little so this is the general store behind it is his butchery and I thought I had a photo of that but anyway um, so he starts getting involved in um, and sort of vertically integrating his operations and um, one of the things that um, I seem to have lost a slide there but one of the things he does is he gets involved in vertical integration so he's raising dairy cows on his farm and he milks them he sells the milk and he makes cheese and he makes butter uh, sells beef obviously, uh, sells mutton, um, sells wool, um, they get into small goods so he's um, making and selling sausages and um, salami, uh, pork, meat, that sort of thing. Um, bacon, big thing, uh, bacon was a huge part of the diet there because of course it didn't have to be refrigerated. Well it did but it didn't go off too quickly if it wasn't if you see what I mean and he would sell all these through a store so he owns the place of production owns where it's manufactured owns where it's retail so it was um, quite an effective sort of um, effective sort of business um, I'm not sure what my point there was I thought I'd focus on miners. Okay, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what my point there was, but um, the point with Naylor is his vertical integration. I'm just going to move on from that. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, 900 acres, 
100 head of dairy, 100 pigs, 1,600 sheep. He's got nearly 30 people working on his farm. I oh, hear it is, thankfully. So here's the Victoria store, here's the butchery, and round the back, he's even got a bakery. And uh, that's the stone built um, thing there. So he, he grows on his farm. I don't, I'm sorry about that slide. He grows on his farm, he even grows wheat. Then he has the wheat processed in a wheat mill that he owns, shares in, and that gets turned into flour, which is then baked in his bakery. So he's got, it's, he hasn't really got a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. He's got, you know, if he's selling pies, he's made every part of the pie, put it that way. Now, when he dies, he is, leaves 18,000 pounds. Now, that's the equivalent of three quarters of a million dollars in today's money. Um, that's for stores, still there, st still the one he built, still got his name on it. Um, for a while they painted it out until they worked out that was pretty dumb to ignore the actual heritage of the area. And um, yeah, you can still visit there. I think periodically it's turned into a restaurant or a bar or who knows, they change things quite regularly there. Now you might be interested if you'd seen the Cadrona when I talked about False Front. This started off as an example of a false front architecture, but now it's actually got a quite a substantial wall built of the um, same at the same height, so it's not really false front anymore. So that's the butcher. It just was convenient to talk about the butcher. Now let's look at the baker, Jesse Gear. Now Jesse Gear, I, he's fascinating. I love this guy. He starts as a journeyman. Baker. Now that means not someone who's qualified, it's someone who does it. Um, he's, goes, he sort of seems to bounce around different bakeries in Victoria and I keep finding <laughs> the only way I know he was baking is because the notices in the various papers are trying to find him and I suspect he's sort of not that good at paying bills as a baker, right, you know, as a worker. And sort of when things get too hot, he just moves to the next town. Anyway, he opens his own store in Tuapeka. Now, in other words, Lawrence. With George Reimer. He parts... Um, now, Baker's. Baker's are really interesting. I'll make the point here. Jean Desire Faro also ran a... Uh, this is Jean Desire Faro, first um, credited with being the first winemaker. He was a baker as well. There's a lot of bakers, I think... Partly because all you really needed, they, they didn't use yeast, they used um, basically made sourdough and you just needed a sourdough starter for that and once you started one you could actually keep that starter going. Um, there's one, one bakery that I, I saw on TV that the same, same starter had been going for over 110 years which just blows my mind slightly. You, obviously you keep renewing it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Bakers of Victoria became the Bakers of Otago. Um, that's Back Creek Bakery, which is a corrugated iron facade over a um, stone oven there from Alexandra. But um, he, so Jesse Gear starts as a baker, comes over here, opens a general store with George Reimer, and that um, basically parts that they end up parting company. It's really interesting about when you look at the bakers, every single baker in Otago was a baker in Victoria. Every single one. I haven't found anyone to vary with that. Now, he goes to Arrowtown and he builds a really substantial building. This is his stables. Jesse Gear builds this. Um, he builds an eight-room house. He builds a bakery. This is um, now this facade has been changed, but the building itself at the back um, was Jesse Gear's um, bakery. It's called the Wellington Bakery, and again he was in business with um, other people to start with. Then he was running it on himself, and I don't. I've, I've got to say I don't know why. Um, he sold up. I don't. Because if you look 
at what he's achieved. He's in an eight room house. He's got a bakery. He's got a shop. The flourishing bakery business, and it's, uh, there's a butchery business included. So he's a sort of jack of all trades. Um, there's a four stall um, stable, and he's going to sell all that. So what I think is, I think he's one of these guys who liked the idea of being part of that rush uh, culture. He was wanting to follow the next opportunity. So, 68, the big thing happening, if you remember the Cardona, is, is Cardona. So he goes there and he shifts and he opens a store and goes spectacularly bust. Absolutely spectacularly bust. Uh, now, <laughs> here's a part of the, um, he has not kept proper books and has concealed the state of his affairs. That's, now, that's against the law then and now. So he he basically goes, and look at this. This is the list of his, the debtors. These are out of his, the bankruptcy files in the um, in archives. And it lists all of his debts. Now, he owes miners. This must have really upset people. Miners rely on him. They deposit. There's no bank, right? Okay, there's no bank operating at the time. So, a lot of storekeepers operate as gold depositors, or gold, de yeah, you can, you would deposit your gold and they would issue you with a receipt. So he does this, and he goes bust, and he's, he's, the gold's not there, the money's not there. So he owes nine miners from Cadrona, four from Area, 18 from Bannockburn, three from West Coast, one in Wellington, what, how do you get to Wellington, I don't know. Um, and there's wholesalers, storekeepers, publicans. He's borrowed off everyone. And as I say, quite a lot worse. Um, he has, um, yeah, he hasn't kept decent records. So he goes from that profitable business in Arrowtown. Well, I'm assuming that, I mean, you don't build those with no money. So I'm assuming it was as good as they say. Flogs it off comes to Cardona with an 18 months deep, deep trouble. And um, then it's quite amazed me that one of the things about this though, you could pick on Jesse, and I don't want to, because as I'll tell you at the end, he's uh, very, very, uh, there's a lot to like about Jesse. If you look at the records, most of the, um, Early Goldfields traders, in fact, Benjamin Naylor that I talked about earlier is one of the exceptions, go bust at some point. Just I, like at Bendigo, the place that I did my PhD on, every single trader except two. I'm going to go two. Um, John Goodall and um, Charles O'Donnell go bust at some point. Now, not necessarily at Bendigo, but somewhere. Um, so going bust wasn't that unusual. It makes for a really fascinating reading as to where money's owed and what they've done. This interbusiness loaning was a that was a lot. Um, I mean, if you imagine you're a publican at Lake Wanaka. He's borrowed money off a local business to keep his own business running, and then kept dodgy uh, records. Um, now, I don't. It's a bit hard to find what he does next because. There's a, there's a rush to Bendigo. So you've got Cardrona is between Wanaka and um, Aratown. Then Bendigo is sort of, uh, it's its own area, just near Taras, but up into the hills a wee bit. 1869, there's a huge, absolutely huge rush for quartz mining to Bendigo. Simply put, there is stone found that is the richest ever in Otago. There were um, some areas of that of the original Cromwell Company claim that was pulling up 15 ounces to the ton, which is huge, absolutely mind-boggling. You could look at the stone and see all the gold in it, it would be that rich. So this temporary town at a place called Logan Town, sort of halfway up the hill, opens as and it's sort of this tent town. And Lane Oliver and Jesse Gear go in together, 
um, Lane Oliver is one of these characters. He's all over the um, the uh, terrace area. His descendants are still there, but they operate a hotel. So, I beg your pardon, a restaurant. A restaurant. So, it's quite obvious gear is a talent as far as cooking goes, because he runs this for six months, and um, then he <laughs> he gets slightly dodgy in that he purchases the A1 Bakery. Now, the A1 Bakery uh, was in the middle of Cromwell, or, uh, uh, in the middle of Logan Town, and I remember try going there and trying to find it, and I couldn't find this bakery. And so I climbed on this pile of stones, and I'm looking around thinking, where's the bakery, until I realised I was standing on a pile of stones, the only pile of stones in Logan Town, which... Uh, even a half would, would have worked out is actually a dismantled oven and that was where the bakery was but anyway gets into trouble he's only three months into it and he's already trying to sell it um splendid bakery business house in center of town new ovens built substantial and suitable manner that's the pile of stones and um he's basically too busy working in the um in the bendigo gully and he offers this for sale. He gets into trouble because he um, he ends up selling a four-bedroom house that wasn't his to sell. So he ends up being hauled before the courts and told, pay the money back that you got for this. So he had to give the £12 he made on selling this house back. Um, it goes, that's a four-bedroom tin house. And it goes into uh, Cromwell as the manse for one of the churches there. Um, but then he disappears. So as far as we can work out, he was probably mining. Um, and he says mining long for a few months. But it's really interesting that his shareholders have a habit of buying him out. So here he's in the deep lead sinking in uh, Bendigo Gully. And the next thing you read is his company have bought him out. And then he starts another business. Also, uh, sorry, Syndicate, also mining in Deep Lead, and then the next thing you find, they buy him out. So, I, th I think he was probably a better baker than he was a miner. Um, then we, we don't hear anything. So, this is uh, 1870, this is for sale. And uh, 18, so, late 1870, he gets in trouble selling the house, but he's disappeared. It doesn't appear anywhere until 1872. And all of a sudden, this ad hits the Cromwell Argus. And it's quite amazing. Here's at a place called Quartzville. Now, Quartzville is not Bannockburn. It's always associated with Bannockburn, but it's not. It's further up the track. To find it, go on to, if you're heading up to um, Bannockburn, go up the main road, turn down Hall Road, and carry on along, and you'll see a sign pointing yourself off to Quartzville, and you can walk up to the area there. But what's interesting there is... He's effected considerable alterations and improvements. It's an increasing business. And he says meals, coffee, cakes, and other refreshments supplied at a minute's notice. Suppers, picnics, weddings, and celebrations. Now, what was, uh, he's uh, advertising as a caterer. Now, what was amazing is you then start reading all around Bannockburn, all around Quartzville, the Carrick Range. Every time there's anything, the caterer, the celebrated caterer is Mr. Jesse Gear, and um, he's, uh, there's comments, uh, I found one, there was a, um, the good fare so sumptuously provided was commented on. Um, and so all around the Neverson area, um, he is the businessman everyone goes to to supply baked goods, you know, um, and they talk about sandwiches and cakes and confections and all sorts of things there. But he dies in 1875, um, and his estate is assessed at nil. His wife carries on that business, by the way. She eventually walks away from the building, because the problem they had was that Courtsville, the, the courts died out. Bannockburn continued as the town. Cromwell continued as the, as the town. She was left um, raising, or try, trying to continue to raise a family with effectively no business. So they walk away from it. Um, 
Um, I always felt find it interesting though that when he had a funeral, his funeral was held. He basically one day was in the bakery. He leaned down to pick something up and just carried on leaning and fell down and he was dead. Um, but his funeral had the whole town of Bannockburn and half the town of Cromwell shut. And people came from Cardona as well. And it was a vast funeral. I always sort of look and think, okay, he's been left with no financial resources when he died. But was he really a failure if he was that loved? And I just throw that one out there. Um, I'll just make a comparison because it's quite interesting to um, list George Wellington Goodger as a comparison. Now, George Wellington Goodger deserves the title of built that he built Cromwell. So he builds the Cromwell water supply, he trades in livestock, he runs the first dairy farm, he runs as a builder, he's a shareholder in a butchery, he runs a stockyard, he um, is on the first um, school committee, he's on the first hospital committee, he is the second mayor of Cromwell uh, because the first mayor forgot to sign his voting papers when he got re-elected. And then he's best known as operating the Junction, Junction Commercial Hotel. You have to remember Cromwell was known as uh, Kawara Junction. Then it became known as just as the Junction. And then John Connell came through in 1865 and said, no, that won't do. You are now called Cromwell. He was a Northern Irishman, basically provoking people, I think. He runs the Commercial Hotel. And this is a very successful hotel. It's very big. It's uh, quite, uh, big in terms of business, but also big in terms of size, and uh, quite a popular business. Um, carries on for quite a long time, actually. And um, so I just have got it now. He, he's the main money man behind the Cromwell Company up on Bendigo. That's where he makes his main money. He owns half of the Swan Brewery. That was run by him and Joseph Coutts, who anglicises his name to C-O-U-T-T-S, or his descendants do, and they go down to set up the, uh, end up setting up the Waitemata Brewery in Auckland, which became DB. So DB started there, you could say. He's uh, here on the um, school committee, and he is just there. Um, he's got a business there in the stables, and he buys, so here's the Junction Commercial Hotel, that's not, he doesn't own it at that point, though. So his assets were zero, and um, other people were running businesses. He lost money on one investment. Basically, right through the 60s and 70s, 1860s, 1870s, if you needed money for anything, you wanted a, to set up a stagecoach route, that's actually one of the ones he backed. You go to George, and he will lend you the money. And um, basically, he invested in the Bannockburn Race Company over on Bannockburn. And um, if you look at my video about sometimes they build races that accidentally go uphill. Well, they don't. They try and go uphill. They had that. And then they lost the actual rights to their water race. And it was really messy. And he lost a fortune. Um, and he dies in 1883. But um, the, the interesting thing about the um, George Wellington Goodyear is there's quite a, quite a challenge to perceptions down there. There are some people who try and say he committed suicide and things like that. I'm not quite sure why there's such a bitterness evidence towards him. But... Um, Many of them, the, um, the businesses lived a pretty hand-to-mouth sort of existence. Um, Jennifer Dickinson's, her um, thesis on uh, women in the goldfields, picks, pans and petticoats. A great title for a thesis. Um, available at the um, Macmillan Brown Library at Canterbury. Um, writes about how... Basically, women were forced, if they were widows, they were forced into running sly grogs or um, even working as prostitutes. The, another very, very good bit of writing is Sandra Quick's chapter on women 
hotel owners in um, central Otago, and that's in the chapter in um, Rushing for Gold. But um, I've found that um, I found that if you really wanted to make money, you couldn't stay a local operator. You couldn't actually stay in Bendigo. You couldn't stay in Cromwell. You couldn't stay in Queenstown. If you you look at people like the Hellensteins, who the name still remains as Hellenstein Brothers and Glassons here. To make their big money, they did not make their money. He, he had stores in Cromwell, in Clyde, in, uh, even in Nevis, in Wanaka, and in Queenstown. But Bendix Hellenstein sold those, goes to Dunedin, starts manufacturing clothing, and that's where he made his real money. Um, I found very little, it probably ex Benjamin Naylor is the exception, very few people who actually made significant money as merchants in Goldfields Town. Um, but if we, so that's just by comparison. You, I mean, you've got, um, so George Naylor, um, Naylor makes decent money. Gear is left with none. Gudja, who virtually sets a whole town up, is left with none. You've got women struggling if they are running businesses. And then we end up with um, a German who's our candlestick maker. And he arrives in Melbourne. Now, a lot, you have to understand, Germany in the 1860s was a very unpleasant, well, 1850s actually, was a very unpleasant place to live. Not because they didn't ask you or anything, it was riven by strife. There was no such country as Germany. You have to remember it was a series of countries and just like uh, Italy, it was a series of small countries and they were always fighting and there was all kinds of nastiness going on and a lot of the early gold rush population were Germans fleeing some form of persecution or another. Some of it was religious persecution. Zyla, Charles George Zyla arrives 1856. Now, he's sent for by Lunger and Thonemann, who are also they're, they're his relatives, and he manages a store at Red Bank in um, Melbourne. So, but this forms a really interesting pattern because a lot of these merchants started off working in... Um, operations in Victoria and then were sponsored over to Otago. Now you think about that, that's a lot better than just risking it and going up and starting your money. If you've got someone behind you and they're supplying you with goods and they have already bulk supply going to their store and they can go to their supplier and say, hey, we've got an extra branch in Otago, supply them too. Um, Zyla does that. So he sets up... Um, after five years, he goes to Weatherstones and he sets up his own store with the backing of his family. Central Otago, he shifts and he's running Zyla and Company in uh, Clyde. And then he changes his name because this is one of those weird situations. They don't like advertising that they're foreign. So give it a nice English sounding name. Now the House of Hanover has supplied the royal family, so instead of, you know that don't you, the British royal family are actually Germans, um, so instead of calling it Zyla and Company, when he builds his new store, he becomes Hanover Stores. And um, he expands, basically Thomas Shanley drowns trying to cross the Clother. A lot of people did that. He tried to cross it on his horse while drunk. Not a good thing. And he expands to Cromwell. And um, he operates this uh, second branch. Um, now, 1869, so he's got two very successful businesses going. And Bendix Hellenstein has run his business in Queenstown, is looking to expand, and Zyla is looking to get out. He wants to cash up and go to Dunedin and really leverage his... Um, money. So Bendix Hellenstein to open his stores in Cromwell and Clyde um, by 
Xyla's operation, Hanover Stores. So Hanover Stores becomes um, Helen Stein's, and um, he moves, Xyla moves from uh, Clyde, and he moves to Dunedin, and he buys a wholesale grocery and liquor business, and um, teams up again with Langer and Thoneman. And what is interesting there, he starts leveraging his money by mortgages. He leans on businesses. And he takes a punt, and it's quite an interesting thing that he, if he sees a good business being badly run, he lends them money until they can't pay it because it's badly run. And then he buys it, yeah, like he calls up the mortgage, um, and it becomes his. Then he puts a new manager in who's got a few clues, and um, he seems to have done this several times. I found two or three examples um, and stop looking when I'm sort of proving my point, that he would put a new manager in, and if the manager had any clues at all, he would finance them into running the business because he wanted to make his money work, not own businesses. So he's quite smart that way. Um, and he gets in Dunedin, he's able to be part of the big money. So he gets involved in the Colonial Bank of New Zealand, the Equitable Assurance Association. 1883, he sells his wholesale grocery wine and um, spirit business to two employees because he's got a chance. The McLeod brothers have been making soap for a long time, but they're, they're apparently fantastic um, chemists, rubbish business people. So he comes along and keeps the family on. So he, he does not, apparently had quite a, a brusque sort of uh, demeanor. But everything would indicate to me he's quite a kindly guy because instead of coming along and saying, you're a rubbish businessman, which they were, that even in the bankruptcy application, they more or less admit that, but they are good soap makers and, uh, and candle makers. So they buy in, he buys in, keeps them on, and he turns this into an empire. Largest candle maker in New Zealand. Um, the, the McLeod company's still going. They make hair pomade, whatever the heck that is. I don't know. You can see that I'm not going to buy much of that. They, um, and when he, when he sells, uh, sorry, when he passes away in 1902, He's got an estate worth £11,000, which is uh, half a million dollars in today's money. Um, so if we look at the overall experience of um, Goldfields Merchants, it's basically no different today. I mean, if, if, if the gold miners are getting lots of gold, the gold merchants... Uh, making lots of money. If there's no gold, they're starving. Because, you know, you get what I mean? The, the two are linked. If you look at um, so-called dairy towns, Timaru, uh, Omaru, um, Ashburton, um, I'm just trying to think, the Gore, those sort of areas that have been traditionally, they're not now because they've got dairy conversions, but if you think about those, the, uh, well, they are dairy, where I'm getting confused. If the butterfat price drops, the tractor salesman makes no sales, right? Uh, the fertilizer salesman makes no sales. The, the woman doing the, um, the, you know, running the local co op store you know, has to put people off because the butterfat price has dropped. And so, if the price of milk drops, you do badly if the milk's going well. Same with the gold. You know, if, if gold miners are doing really well, then the gold merchants are doing really well. If the gold miners are doing poorly, same thing. You get what I mean? So if you look at these businesses and these businessmen, you couldn't really predict that they're doing well simply because they're running a business and they're not miners. The only thing you can predict from looking at them, um, there's Clyde, there's Cromwell, the only thing you can predict from them is that they're, is that they're businesses. Um, are they all making money? No. Are they all making great money? No. Do some of them make good money? Yes. 
How do you make a prediction? Well, you can't. Simple as that. Um, so that's a wee bit, as you see. So I've just given you a sort of a, a survey of um, some of these merchants. Uh, as I say, at some point I need to make a point that I can then turn into an article to finally publish the thing. I've had about 600 goes at uh, producing it, but haven't yet. Anyway, on to the next one.